Kevin Fry, David West up front. Three guard rotation of Chalmers, who was really frustrated yesterday. Alvin Brown gets the start for the injured David Young. And Romain Sato, the other in that three guard rotation. For the head coach, Thad Mata, 23 and 5 in his first season at the helm, 47 wins in two years as a collegiate head coach. This is the number 23 team in the country coming in. The Dayton Flyers up front will have Brooks Saul along with Keith Waliskowski and the guy we told you about in our open sophomore, Sean Finn, the huge tournament so far. Ramad Marshall and David Morris helped to round out the backcourt for the Dayton Flyers. And their head coach in his eighth season at the helm, Oliver Purnell. He has won 130 games as head coach of the Flyers overall, including his years at Old Dominion and Radford, 231 career coaching victories. One of the things that Oliver Purnell has to worry about potentially today that Thad Mata does not is the fatigue factor. This is Dayton's third game in three days. Dayton does lead the overall series. Xavier has never beaten Dayton three times in one season. It's happened five times before that they've met three times. They've already won both meetings on their home floor and at UD Arena this year. And one thing that could stand in the way for the Musketeers, their fine wing player, Dave Young, has a hairline fracture of his left wrist. He will not be playing, and that changes all their chemistry. And he started 28 straight games this year. Alvin Brown drawing the start for the first time since his sophomore year. Hall, too strong on the three to begin the game. And West doing what he does best, clears the glass. Now the Musketeers were so frustrated offensively in the first half of yesterday's game against the box and one defense of UMass. A little different here. Dayton is going to play some straight man. We'll see a little zone later in the game. That's Fry. Found a shooting touch yesterday. And driving to the basket is going to get called for the offensive foul. He picks up his first. Good start for Sean Finn. Yesterday, he was dominant blocking shots. Here you see him put his body on the line. That's very important because Oliver Purnell said he must stay out of foul trouble. Calling for the ball inside. And there he is getting the ball. Only fly on, and he gets an easy look at the hoop. Well, that's why you're shooting 72%. He made a good point. It's, it's a little early to canonize him as the next Bill Russell, but if he stays on the court, he changes the way they defend. He allows the perimeter guys to get out and challenge the ball. They can funnel in toward him, and he can swap the shot away, as he did yesterday. Got him. Got a... Partial block there, and now West on the turnaround, too strong with it. And Finn again asserts himself on the inside. Last time these teams met at the Sinta Center, the Flyer big men did not show up. That's the main reason Xavier won. Looks like so far, they are very aggressive, and that's going to go a long way and see who gets his victory. Marshall just inside the foul line to miss. Hall had the tip follow and couldn't hit it. One thing that Dayton has lamented in their two meetings is they've had good inside looks at the basket and have not converted. And there's a runner for Charmos who was absolutely frustrated from the floor yesterday, but he gets on the board early here. Morris on the drive, and there's one of those easy looks that Dayton feels they have to convert. Big concern for Thad Mata. His team sleepwalked through the first half yesterday. They looked very lethargic on the defensive end. Screen there, Sato. And another screen to free him up. Too strong with the three. Wallace Kowski, though, touched it last, and the ball will belong to Xavier. David Morris has been the recipient of good post play. His big guys are doing work. It takes the big guys for Xavier and really forces them. And there's David Young next to his counterpart, Coleman, who's going to get extra minutes because of that. That's, um, that looks like Elton. That was Coleman. Don't believe that, is Young suited up in this game? I don't think he is. No, he is not dressed. Wallace Kowski. Banging one off the glass, out on the fast break, with the opportunity to extend the lead now to four for the Flyers. We will not be seeing Young in this game. He is a street pro. West got the friendly roll, and it still wouldn't sit for him. Ohio. 
Well, only when these teams play, it's the Blackburn McCafferty Trophy that's up for grabs. This time, it's the Atlantic 10 Trophy. Stelly, who's had a good Atlantic 10 tournament, hits on his shot, and Dayton now to a six-point lead. Doesn't this look like the start to yesterday's Xavier game? They came out like they were running in sand. Sato on the spin. Still can't hit. They were 4 for 23 in the first half yesterday from the floor. They are 1 for 7 to begin here tonight. Offensively, the Flyers rely on balance. In yesterday's game, they had six players in double figures. The last year, they had Tony Stanley as the go-to guy. This squad doesn't have that luxury. They all share the responsibility. Ben left it a little bit short, and that's another of those looks that they need to convert on. West working inside, and he gets fouled by Finn before the shot. The one question that I would have, and I mentioned, is the fatigue factor. You've got three games in three days for Dayton. You're going up against a big guy like West. If you're Finn, you're coming off a career-high 30 minutes yesterday, so you're seeing a very quick early substitution pattern for the Flyers. I think they're really trying to guard against the big-time fatigue that could be hitting. And physically, these guys are in great shape, but mentally, I think that's where a lot of the fatigue really comes into play. Another foul on the inbound. Oh, there he is. That is David Young, the junior from Newcastle, Pennsylvania, who has a hairline fracture in his wrist sustained yesterday. They're not sure when he'll be able to play again, but obviously out for tonight. In transition, there was a flagrant foul. He went down hard. Coach Mata wanted to put him back in. He said, I can't do it. And where did they miss him on the offensive end? They miss all those shots. He might be their best offensive rebounder. Dry looping one over the top. West. He already has more attempts here in his first half than he had in the entire first half yesterday, but he's 0 for 3. You notice they took Finn off West. Ball. That's an air ball. Never really got set or his shoulder squared to the basket. So. A slow start offensively for both sides. Thus far, Thad Mata seeing that one too many times here in Philadelphia. His team down by six here early. Oh, here in the first half, Xavier's been held to two points here in the early going, and there's been some battling going on inside. David West off to a slow start, 0 for 3. And you got away with it if you're Xavier against UMass. This is a better defense. They contain very well. Notice the great defense by Walskowski. And Albert Purnell said he's got to keep Finn on the court. That's why he moved him off of David West. Walskowski can be a warrior in there. And he's seen David West for sure. These guys have gone back at one another. The player of the year in the Atlantic 10. Trying to get it going, and right now he is not 0 for 3 from the floor. Sato is 0 for 4. Very hard to figure out Dayton's defense. They're in man-to-man -man now, but sometimes they'll disguise it. Occasionally, they'll mix it up mid-play. West was calling for the basketball, but lost it as he tried to spin toward the baseline. Wallacekowski there, and that is the second turnover now called. The Musketeers. minutes in and Xavier's got to be feeling a little bit of deja vu right now. Offensively some structure here. Trying to get Stelly off the screen. If it breaks down they go into motion. And there's the motion as Hall converts and makes it an eight point Dayton lead. You know the Musketeers came back against UMass because the Minutemen don't have the offensive firepower. If they get down too big Dayton will bury them. Sato now try to post up down low. That great leaping ability. Stelly came over to knock it away, but a turnover again down low. A big part of the offense is the spacing, and what does that allow? Backdoor cuts. Brooks Hall made a real nice up cut to get open. There's Hall from the foul line, a little bit too strong. West on the juggle, and Hall is going to get called for the foul. Kind of incidental contact, but it's going to be his second. And team foul number three. That'll be a fun matchup to watch. Hall and Sato, both of them played their high school basketball in date. They know each other very well. Sato's going to have to play a lot more small forward in this game with Dave Young out. 
11 trips down the floor. And one scoop shot from Chalmers is all they had to show for it in six minutes of basketball. I remember yesterday they had 13 field goals for the entire game. They won that game at the free throw line. A fact not lost on Steve Lapis from UMass afterward. Chalmers tossed an air ball on the run. The ball is going to belong to Xavier off the hand of Ramon Marshall down on the baseline. That'll be Keith Jackson, the freshman, checking in. He'll get uh, perhaps a little bit more time in this one. With David Young hurt, he leads the reserves in minutes at a little bit better than 16 per game this year. Still trying to find an offensive flow of the Musketeers. Chalmers, that's a wild shot, but he did get contact. And that's going to send him to the free throw line as David Morris gets hit for the personal. Lionel Chalmers, to me, is a significant measuring stick for how Xavier is playing. This team goes as he does. Everybody focus on West and Sato because they're the all-conference players, but Lionel Chalmers yesterday was totally uninvolved. He had a pretty decent floor game, but he didn't score a field goal, and he had four turnovers. Don't forget, coming up when this one is done tonight, You've got game two of the semifinals here in the Verizon Atlantic 10 Men's Championship. The Cinderella LaSalle Explorers against, well, maybe to a degree, the other Cinderella, the Richmond Spiders. <laughs> I um, I was pretty confident there would be a Philly team in the Final Four, but I expected it to be Temple or St. Joe's, not LaSalle. How many expected it to be all Atlantic 10 West teams in the Final Four? Morris, the miss, and Keith Jackson pulls down the rebound as Xavier tries to get it going. Fry wide open. Found his shot yesterday. It deserted him there. And Finn gets himself another rebound. That's his second. Marshall has the numbers to try to take it down the floor. And a reach-in foul is called as he's on his way to the hoop. Chalmers will be called for the personal. Good idea for Dayton. Try to beat David West and the A-10's best defense down the court. And Lionel Chalmers making a mistake. Yeah, you might have got some ball. But a lot of times, the official's going to call what usually happens. And on a reach-in play, that's what you see. Set play and finish foul. Now, this is an area of, to a degree, concern for him. He is not a very good free-throw shooter. And that's something that you would imagine as he continues along in his career and development. He's going to get sent to the line quite a bit. That's something he's going to have to work on and get more consistent with. Big problem is big hands. Dayton ready for mass substitution. Jobbers just got his second, and then you see the line change that's coming here for the Flyers. I guess you could say the line change coming for the Flyers when you're in the first union spectrum. <laughs> it's been said many times before. Been too strong with it. As we said, he really struggles from the line. That looked like a 50% foul shot. I'm, I'm surprised, though, because Thad Mata yesterday in the post-game interview said that one of the things he likes about his team is they don't foul very much. We've seen them reaching. What's that uh, an ingredient of? That they're tired, they're fatigued, they're not moving their feet. It should not be. There's a better free throw and a good rotation from Finn as he gets one out of two, and he's going to come out of the game, replaced by Yante Holland. But Dayton right now sitting on top of a seven-point lead here, almost seven minutes in. I like Dayton's bench a lot. And if they're going to win this thing, it's going to be four games in four days. That would be a significant challenge without a bench. Be unprecedented in terms of the Atlantic 10 and also not something that you've seen a whole lot nationally ever. West forced it. Jackson got himself a gift rebound and fouled on the way back up as Holland caught a piece of him on the putback attempt. Well, Yante Holland gets called for the personal. That'll be his first. You know, sometimes you look at a struggling offense and you say, is this bad offense or great defense? I think this is outstanding defense. We haven't seen Xavier with an uncontested shot yet. And Jackson is going to have to have some solid minutes. He seems like he's fallen a little bit out of favor of late, has not had great minutes. Now remember, this is where Xavier did win their game, as we mentioned yesterday. 33 out of 43 from the free throw line. And that was enough to get by UMass in overtime, despite a crazy three-point shot that sent the game to the extra period. Six-point Dayton lead. In both games that Xavier won earlier this year, they took control in the second half. 
So far this first half early has belonged to Dayton. Stelly is wide open and he missed on an open three-pointer. He has shot well over the course of this tournament. There you see the numbers. One out of 11 for the fourth best shooting team in the conference. Ramon Marshall, the only Dayton starter on the court at this time. They're, they're inverting the offense. West is coming off the screen. Boy, he looked totally off balance. It's another force. They continue to force from bad angles. And it's one of the reasons they're struggling so badly. It's one out of 12 from the floor. West is 0 for 5. Got one of the hidden flaws of the Musketeers. They are not a very good interior passing team. They have a tough time throwing it into the post. Sato missed. West put back finally. He finally got one to go for himself. And on the putback, Xavier back to within four. Well, that's better than yesterday. It took him 35 minutes before he got his first bucket. Skelly on the sharp cut around the screen. The ball last touch Xavier and Kevin Fry, so it will belong to Dayton when we come back. 11-29 to go here in this first half of play. And so far for the Dayton Flyers, Things have gone right here in this first half. They've got the lead. Atlantic 10 Conference that is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent, the Atlantic 10 Conference is strictly prohibited. Dayton, as always, with their faithful, and they do have a strong contingent of fans. Very vocal contingent that was here yesterday as they closed out St. Joseph's. Both these teams very well represented at home and are represented again here tonight. Credit to the fan base. Key statistic to watch in this game. It's clear that there's going to be a lot of contested shots. Who's able to control the rebound? Bounce pass by Green, got knocked out of bounds by Williams. So they will have eight seconds left to shoot as they inbound. Mason Williams coming on as Lionel Chalmers sits with a pair of personals. Shot clock. Jones, oh my! Straight acceleration down the lane, and that's a big defensive mistake for the Musketeers. Right. And David West has to be able to contest that shot. I know they want to keep him out of foul trouble, but if a guy dribbles beyond the three-point arc unscathed, that's bad defense. Sato posting up. Still can't get it to fall. Remain Sato is 0 for 6. Williams got a hand in the passing lane. That'll slow Dayton down temporarily, but... We want to talk about the C part for you here as the shot clock winds down. And watch David West. He never even stepped over. He made no attempt to even change the shot. That's the uh, defensive player of the year in this conference. Playing back here as Marshall fires a long one, and West covers up the long rebound as fourth. And there you see it is... We got a contact down along the baseline. Quarterfinals against UMass, 4 out of 23, 2 out of 15. Put it together, you don't have to be a genius. 6 out of 38 in first halves in these two games. I'm glad I don't have to be a genius. I think I'm going to leave that statement right where it is. <laughs> I'm just, I'm very surprised, though, because they've been aggressive, and that, that ball didn't go in, but at least it looked like he really wanted it. He demanded it and went up strong. Two out of 16. Almost unconscionable for a team that generally gets good looks and shoots the basketball well. Jones comes wide open. Passed up the open look. They try to bang it into Finn, and a foul call is coming on Anthony Coleman. Trying to deny the ball to Finn down along the baseline. Well, the freshman Coleman gets called for the personal. See the numbers? Flyers are shooting at 40%. That's dwarfing the 13. And Finn, obviously being schooled in catch, don't come back down and just shoot. Doesn't look like he's comfortable quite yet with that. And what we're seeing is defensively, both teams are staying between the ball and the basket making everything be a jump shot over the top. West, there's that move that he used yesterday through the lane. It didn't fall. Coleman finally 
does get one to fall for the Musketeers. I'll tell you, Tim, I'll say the same thing I said yesterday. They've shot very poorly, and yet they're only down four points. UMass never did officially put them away yesterday when they could have, and Xavier hung around. Now when you defend and rebound, you're going to stay in every game. Let me tell you right now, this is going to be an ugly, sloppy shooting game because I don't see good legs for either team. They look very, very sluggish. And I think that's because they're not used to playing back-to-back -back situations. Keith Jackson going to get called for the personal on the drive. That's team foul number five for the Musketeers as Brooks Hall makes his return and he'll replace DJ Stelling. One thing that's easy to see when you follow this league, the A-10 is loaded with excellent coaching. We see a lot of different defenses. Makes it very difficult to score. Bounce pass to the inside, broken up by Williams. He'll try to run now. He's two on four. Back to the top in a more traditional offensive set. A box set. A lot of screen. A lot of spacing. Sato. There's a friendly roll for Sato as he gets his first field goal in seven tries. And Xavier is within a bucket. Parnell told us that he was not going to use a box in one like UMass yesterday. It doesn't really appear like they need it. There are a couple of reasons that that UMass box in one worked so well yesterday, not the least of which was that Xavier was missing a lot of open jumpers. Bounce pass was late. And now here comes Jackson. Trying to find his man. Jones took it away. Couldn't save. And a reach-in foul called on Marshall as he reached in on David West, who was trying to find the open man. Changes for both sides. Brown returns along with David Morris. Kevin Fry will come in momentarily. Scott, when your offense isn't clicking, how do you scrap and find ways to win? Well, one way is to get loose balls and have a chance to get to the foul line. That's good on the first. Another try coming. Seventy-six percent line this year for David West. On top of some other very good numbers. And hitting it again there, he'll be replaced by Kevin Fry, but Xavier's climbed back in, and they've tied this game up despite shooting four out of 19 here in the first half. Dayton's resiliency in terms of field goals going away. Wallace breaks it. 15-footer for the baseline for Wallace minutes to go now here in this first half. Now with West on the bench, who becomes the folks has got to be Sato. He's really the only guy out there that looks like an offensive threat. Coleman says, I am one too. How big is that? Anthony Coleman stepping into a shot. Xavier <laughs> ties the game. He's been as effective in his one minute as David West was in the whole first start of this game. Fry wins the fight for that rebound, and the Musketeers now try to come down for their first lead here in this first half. Williams, Watson, in and out. Now the other way, Wallace-Kowski makes like a wide receiver on the pass from Morris. Pretty catch, and a stutter step that allowed him to lay in. You know why they're able to get that play? Because Xavier sends four guys to the offensive glass every time. If they secure a rebound, the Flyers can get out and fly. That's going to bring us to a timeout on the floor. 6.52 to go here in this first half. And Dayton, which had gone through a field goal drought, has found its way back inside in transition to retake a two-point lead. First half of play. Look at our U.S. Airways out-of-town scoreboard with the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philadelphia in the background. Full recap, opening round, UMass got by GW, by 11. Dayton, a winner with a big second half over Rhode Island. It was LaSalle beating Fordham. Mike Cleave starting a terrific tournament run.
and St. Bonaventure. Had a big game from J.R. Bremer beat Duquesne. Man of the quarterfinals yesterday. Overtime, Xavier beat UMass to get here. St. Joe's knocked out by Dayton. The big effort from Finn. Cleaves another big game. And LaSalle unseats Temple. And then last night, a super game from Richmond. An incredible three-point shooting performance. And they win to earn their spot in the semifinals. Here's the zone defense. Good idea because it kind of takes the set play that Xavier would have run and eliminates it. Williams got hit on the way in. And he's going to earn a trip to the free throw line with six and a half to go here in this first half. Bit surprised early on. Dayton is the best rebounding team in the Atlantic 10. And it has been the Musketeers that have been pounding them. Oliver Purnell has to be concerned about that. Okay, look at Jason Williams. Young man out of Aurora, Colorado. Williams and Jackson provide the energy off the bench. Neither player looking good on their free throws. When Williams releases the ball, Scott, watch how he doesn't hold his follow through. By the time the ball hits the rim, his hands are already down at his side. You see Green coming in. His spin has drawn his second foul. It's one thing that Oliver Purnell was concerned about. Point ball game. With Finn on the bench, Wallace now becomes more of a traditional center. The innate Green will share the dirty work. Brooks Hall came around the screen nicely on the catch and shoot, but couldn't hit it. And Brown, the emergency starter for Xavier tonight, comes down with the rebound. Bodies flying down the lane. And the foul call will go against Nate Green. Grabbing on to try to stop Kevin Fry. So Green will get hit for his first. Check that Wallace Gowski. Yeah, he was battling David West. They wow. get physical inside. If you take a look, you could have gone either way because you got that battle there and then coming down the lane. Fry got thrown by Nate Green. <laughs> you talk about physical, you're seeing your share of it tonight. That's a rivalry game, Scott. These schools located in close proximity. The players spend time in the summer and summer leagues going head to head. This is the front end of the one and one for West. And under six minutes to go now in the half. They do the one point lead in the basketball. You also have to add into the equation that these teams look on the other side of the bracket and see that Temple is no longer there. Green. Got fouled. Oh no, wrapped up on his way in. An offensive foul called on Nate Green for hooking as he went by. Nate Green looks like a linebacker more than a power forward. Sometimes he doesn't know his own strength. I also believe that David West did a little bit of acting. Oliver Fernell agrees with you. Four turnovers on each side. been extremely deliberate in a couple of his looks. And there's some good interior passing that frees up Sato for a chance at a three-point play. You talk about the high low across the lane, there it was. In the open, I called David West a matchup nightmare. Why? When he gets the ball and demands it, he can share the ball. He's very versatile. And if you don't send the double team, he can knock down that little mid-range jump shot. Scott, whenever they go into him and he gets the post touch, good stuff has been happening. John Finn comes back in now to replace Green, who sits with three fouls. And Sato tries to cap off the three-point play. And does. The Musketeers with their first lead of the ball game as we come up on the five-minute mark now remaining here in the half. Skelly can't get there. Ball is knocked out of bounds by Sato. So a fresh shot clock in the inbound from the baseline for Dayton. Safe to say that we're seeing a little preview of best two teams in the Atlantic 10 next year. These teams will both get much better. They're very young. So, they're going to be 
12 to 4 run, although it has felt a little bit more like a 12 to 4 run. Alaskowski rejected by Sato. Remains Sato with that superb leaping ability, but now look at the quick hands from the center. And Williams pays it off. Timeout called for by Oliver Purnell, and he is furious. Wanted a foul call, didn't get it down at the other end, and it turned into a transition basket. Dayton on the business end of a 6-0, 14-4 spurt. Xavier blocked shots as well as anybody in the Atlantic 10. West and Sato both getting into it. And so far, even though David Young has been out, Jason Williams and Jackson have done a nice job providing the spark. I'm going to tell you what. If you can get easy transition points in this game, they're golden because you're not going to get many open touches against either one of these teams' half-court defenses. That's true, and you can see some of the transition baskets are making their presence felt. You see the field goal turn around for the Musketeers. Dayton had a very good shooting start to the game, and they have watched that kind of fizzle. It's been a transition. Oliver Purnell knows that if he doesn't deal with Sato and West, he's going to be in big trouble. Now, they've gotten off to a pretty good start, but things are starting to change. West and Sato are now finding shots. First time they played at UD Arena, Sato was nothing short of spectacular. Wadowskowski just misfired badly on that shot from the baseline. That's got to be a partial block. So they reset it again. Coming up on four minutes left in the half. Sato again inside and hanging on for dear life was Ramad Marshall. He's going to get caught for his second foul. Dayton is up over that double limit, so Xavier goes to the line for two shots the rest of the way. This time it'll be Sato that goes to the strike. Very surprised that Romain Sato is not first team all league. I know that you consider him the most valuable player in the conference. I. I look at the team and, and they're all very, they're all very worthy, but I, I think that if you look at the champions of the league, that maybe Rasul Butler would be the name that you could take off of that list. I think the possibility exists that there'd be some question about a couple of players there. But not remain Sato. Thad Mata knows that he's had such a dominant sophomore year. Well, he was good last year, but I just never foresaw this kind of an explosion in his game. For my money in the games I saw, he was not only first team, he was MVP, he was the player of the year this year. And he defends. All defensive team. When your best two players both defend, it sends a message to everybody on the squad. And that defense right there creates another turnover. So very gradually, Thad Mata's team is working its way back into this game. They have forged out a six-point lead after a rough start. Atlantic 10 basketball action. Semifinals of the Men's Championship, the Verizon Men's Championship here. The first Union Spectre, the Verizon Game Story. 3.47 to go in the first half. Xavier has come back to lead it by six. You see the shooting percentage is kind of normalizing, but neither one has been good. And Xavier again getting it done with their free throws, their points in the paint, despite just one for eight from David West. And when you're not making layups, you can't expect to make jump shots either. It's a very fortunate thing that David West and his crew can get to the free throw line because that's been the strongest part of their attack. Xavier goes at it again as we come up on the three and a half minute mark. But Sato really wants it in the post. That's a tough matchup versus Hall. Nice catch by West over the top of Wallacekowski. Holland changed his shot though. And Wallacekowski comes down with the rebound. Good helping defense from Yante Holland. Whistle away from the basketball. Now call is going to go against Kevin Fry. No Fry gets hit for his second foul. And Xavier will go with their jumbo package. Coleman and West. A lot of shot blocking in the lineup. You can add Romain Sato to that equation. He's a very good shot blocker for a perimeter guy. He is all over Brooks Hall. Will not allow him the basketball on the perimeter. Morris off with his three. 
the long rebound did not touch West's hand, according to the officials, so it goes back over to the Musketeers. Without belaboring the point, it, it may be too late for that, but when you're in a three-game and three-night situation, your legs are tired. Your mind is willing, but your legs are not going to deliver a shot the same way. You can't rely on the jump shot. That's where you would expect that Xavier would have the advantage being off the first night. West missed there and is just one for ten from the floor, but got the contact. That will send him to the free throw line. This is not really new. West has really gone up in the stat sheet, kind of gone to the whip, as it were, in the second half, both times this year, against Dayton. But he's demanding the ball, Scott, and that one for nine start is so surprising because. He has been Mr. Consistent. He leads the Atlantic 10 in field goal percentage. Another try coming for the big man. And hitting it, Xavier now with an eight-point lead on a 10-0 run for this Musketeers team. Wallaskowski blocked away by West, but the foul call, and it is going to be on West. Who disagrees? Notice the recognition. Jumper's not falling. Go put your body on somebody. And David West cannot afford a second foul. They really need him to have a, a clean run at them in the second half. Walskowski at the line. His brother Adam playing some college basketball for Florida State in the ACC tournament. They were defeated last night. Wallaskowski makes a pair. So that cuts into the 10 nothing run, and now you're seeing some trapping pressure coming from Dayton. Good idea because Lionel Chalmers is on the bench. This great. Not yes, great play made by Yante Holland. Taking it away on the sideline, throwing it off Romain Sato, and that gets the ball back for the Flyers. There's Chalmers with his two. This is not a great ball handling team here for Xavier. Great hustle by Holland. Energy guy. Block shot so far in that play, and now trying to get in the offensive column. Can't get two shots over Coleman. And Xavier gets it back. This is a possession that may take a mature approach. Get Lionel Chalmers a little bit more rest. Get a couple ball reversals. West got it for the baseline. He had been one for nine before that shot, but he now has eight first half points. How big is the wall that Dayton seems like they just hit? Well, you can tell. Just not a whole lot happening for the Flyers. And there is the foul call on West inside. That is number two. That's what you said had to be avoided. And now with 1.43 to go in the half, he got it. David West cannot argue. When you're totally away from the ball, why even risk the contact? Walskowski is a cerebral player. David West is very smart himself, but that was not an intelligent play. And Wallaskowski trying to make him pay. Let's take a look and see. Yeah, he's away from the ball. Okay. There's the bump in the back as he went through the lane. They got him the call. Now that's going to happen on most trips down the floor, and it depends on whether the officials see something or not. Well, the good thing is that he got his second foul with under two minutes to go. Dad Mott is going to want to talk this thing over and remind his team on what has got them the lead, and that's being aggressive, being patient with their offense. But when they see that gap, it's kind of like you know the, the running back grabs the ball and sees that that little daylight. You have to make a burst for it. They've done that very well. So 141 to go here till halftime. West still shaking his head, and in reality, the first foul call is probably the one that he should be more incredulous about because look at the replay on that block shot did not look like there was any contact at all coming up at halftime larry rosen our tournament host will be here we'll take a look at our second game that is coming up with sal and richmond later on tonight we'll also have highlights and 
statistics in this first half of play. Worth noting again, this is not a very good offensive lineup for Xavier. Good athletes, but not considered a real high scoring offense. Sato the miss, and it was the long rebound that set this up, and Hall converts. And all of a sudden, Dayton pulls itself back up, and they're within three. They had gone five and change without a field goal. Earlier in the half, about four minutes without a field goal. Chalmers West, both two fouls. Sato finally gets it going from the outside. He is now three for ten, shooting the basketball in the first half. Well, how good did that look? And he's going well. That's what you see out of Sato. Morris committed himself picking up the dribble. And now Marshall. With under a minute to play. Bit of a surprise last three games. Dayton, 95 points, 90 and 81. They have 24 going into halftime. Marshall had it taken away. And now Xavier has transition ball, three on three, and Williams can't hit it. Oh, that might have been a good time to pull it up and get one shot. That's precisely what Dayton looks like they're planning to do now, under 20 seconds to go in the half. Morris calls the play. They come out and challenge. Off that high screen, just two seconds to go in the half. Morris washing, can't get it to sit. Now, what had been a very promising first half for the Dayton Flyers. So that modest team finally finds some range from outside and inside and find the basket. And that has pulled Xavier to a six-point halftime lead. The third meeting of the season between these two teams. Xavier trying to do what no team in Xavier history has done before. That is beat Dayton three times in one season. Stay tuned. Larry Rosen, our tournament host, will be coming up with more here at halftime. The Musketeers lead it by six at the break. For much of the end of that first half with two personals back on the floor. I like the idea of Finn covering Fry on the perimeter. Oh, what a shot. West took it underneath, called for the basketball from across the floor. And on the reverse lane, now has double digits, 10 points on the night. This is where that first round by really makes a difference. Xavier has a chance to be a little fresher. Play all year long to earn that by, and Xavier did. And now Sato, quick hands to the outside, but Finn comes up with it. Shot clock under 10. Marshall going up. Can't get it to sit. Finn the putback. We're really enjoying watching Finn play. Remember last year as a freshman, he had 33 points all season. He had 29 in his last two games coming into this one. He's certainly begun to assert himself. Now West calling for the basketball. You can sense he's going at it hard now, but off the miss, Finn gets himself another rebound. His fifth. Morris into the lane. Good look for Finn, and the juggling catch results in a chance for the three-point play. The basket is good, but more importantly, maybe the foul is on David West, his third. has committed his third silly foul of the game. He contested real nice here. Comes in late, hit him on the top of the head. He didn't get the arm. It might be a little bit of a cheap foul. But you know what? He made contact while the guy was shooting the ball. And may earn him a seat on the bench now for the foreseeable future as he jumps up and grabs his seventh rebound of the game. Now, Coleman is coming in for West. But David West has to be extremely careful right now. And you've got to believe if Dayton gets the ball back, they're going to go right at him. Well, they got the ball back, or did they? Yes, they did. And now Morris looking to run the floor ahead to Hall. And the tip in for Wallace Kowski. So Dayton is back within a bucket as Hall is slow to get up. Brown 
got it. Three-point jumper for Alvin Brown to break the Xavier momentum. Now, this would be a good time to get West. Boy, that's a quick shot. It went in, but you know, they can get that shot any time that they want. This is the exact antithesis of the first half. Chalmers, good look underneath for Brown. It opened for him. Brown snuck in behind the defense. And all of that sloppy offense is gone. It's been replaced by crisp basketball here in this first two and a half minutes of the second half. And Finn with good position down low. Uh, how West, smart is that? West was helpless to do anything about it. There's nothing that West can do with three fouls. Finn already has six points here in the second half of the first two minutes and 40 seconds. 2-3 zone. Nice adjustment. Much different second half. Excellent shooting. And the freshest guy on the court is Brown, and he didn't play much in yesterday's game. Sato, too strong with it. Nothing West could do as he was boxed out by Hall. And Wallace beat everyone down the floor, and suddenly Dayton has tied this game. All right, yesterday, first half, Xavier sleepwalk. Started this game, they came out lethargic. Started the second half, third lethargic. They, they may want to revisit how they start the halves of these games. And Brown travel. Of the 16-28 mark, Thad Mata has got to be frustrated at this 13-5 Dayton run looks on. If there's one thing that's a strength of Walskowski's game, it's the 94-foot sprint. He beat Fry and West down the court. We see him do that all season long. Flyers have gotten out on fast break attempts. West now out of the game, replaced by Anthony Coleman. Nowhere for Morris to go inside. Walskowski, and now Hall open. Too strong, follows his own shot. And Finn grabs the rebound over everyone. Third try at it. This one from Marshall. This looks like the difference between a team that has an NCAA bid locked up savior and a team that is fighting for their lives wanting to go. 16 to 5 run and a timeout called for by the Musketeers. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And on the third try, there was the charm for Ramon Marshall as Dayton is retaking the lead. Fire. You're a happy camper right now as Dayton has shown another offensive punch courtesy of Sean Finn. Offensive rebounding, a big part of the flyer attack. You notice the late recipient of a little hard work inside. Sean Finn is really long. He has good hands, excellent footwork, and Xavier can be exploited. Remember last year, Xavier finished the season under Skip Cross around a downer as well. They are not closing seasons, and this is a tough zone to penetrate. The change in shooting here in the second half, especially for the Flyers. I saw those numbers on Finn. Six of his points, three of his boards coming in four minutes here to begin the second half. Chalmers got into no man's land. Fry, good job of getting his man in the air and nailing the three-point jumper. First three points of the game for Kevin Fry. They're fronting Finn. They may want to take a look at a lob over the top. Five minutes into the second half, and we are up to hand-to-hand -hand combat time. Morris got it. Oh, they're going to wave it off on the offensive foul. Fry stood in the way and took it and laid down in front of Morris with a contact underneath the hoop. I don't think it's an official statistic, but the guy that leads the Atlantic 10, in my estimation, taking charges is Kevin Fry. And you saw the immediate call that waved off that basket. So Xavier gets the basketball back when we come back. The physical battle continues here in the second half. Fun for both these teams trying to earn a spot in the Atlantic 10 Championship Final here at the First Union Spectrum tomorrow night. U.S. Airways out of town scoreboard. Had they get here from yesterday, Xavier a winner in overtime over UMass. Dayton beat St. Joseph's, knocking them out. Been a big game.
Then in the night half, LaSalle, the upset, beating Temple for the second time this year. And Richmond, bombing away from the outside, beat St. Bonaventure at their own game. And Richmond LaSalle game will follow here tonight about 25 minutes after the completion of this one. Lionel Chalmers has to upgrade his attack. He's not aggressive, only one for two from the field. Especially with David West on the bench. This is Sato. And Sato had it taken away. His pocket picked by the little guy. Morris finding the open man. Once again, the more traditional set. Dayton has been hitting the glass hard here offensively. Off the miss, they do it again. Wow. And Finn looked like he was fouled on the putback by Fry. You know, typically, you get used to David West grabbing all the rebounds. They're going to have to do a little more gang rebounding if you're the Musketeer. Four of those rebounds belong to Finn. Nice take to the hole around the outside of the defense by Chalmers. And at calculated risk, David West is coming back in the game with the three fouls. There is Finn going to work on Fry. Got a big size advantage. He got it over him, couldn't get it to fall. Holland hit the offensive glass again. This time rejected. Dayton fans calling for a foul. They're not going to get. Chalmers again. Can't get it to go. Another rebound for Finn. That's why they've got to get West back in the game. Xavier's not seeing a rebound right now. Too strong by Marshall on the three. You know, second half, Dayton is not following, and they're not putting the Musketeers on the line. That's how Xavier scored most of their points in the first half. And almost all of them yesterday. Reverse lay-in for Jackson, and Chalmers penetrating now. Something Oliver Purnell said he had to keep in front of him. Had to keep the point guard in front of his defense. He's gotten behind him now. Three straight possessions. From where I sit, this is a game that looks like it's going to go right down to the wire. It's like Xavier had yesterday, an overtime victory against UMass. Musketeers, a team that seems to have its... Big dance ticket punch for the NCAAs. Dayton would need to win the tournament to get there. Stelly running out of time. Still got the shot away and on the rim. And a rebound on the weak side for Keith Jackson. Dayton a couple of good looks inside. That's deja vu for them to the previous two meetings with Dayton, in which they missed. Make that with Xavier, in which they missed. Shots from the paint. Very uneven second half. Started out very hot scoring. Now we're back to the methodical and non-scoring pace. Sato stripped inside. Now two on one. Finn's going to get a chance to finish. And does. You know, rather than arguing with the referees, Xavier may want to explore a little transition defense. It looked like Sean Finn almost missed that dunk. Like the way that he held the rim down allowed it to stay in. And the officials are now going to call time as the scoreboard and shot clock at the other end of the floor have gone out. Why? Because Sean Finn threw down the power dunk. That's probably it. I mean, I've heard of Daryl Dawkins breaking a backboard in this arena. I bet he never broke a shot clock. Something that Sean Finn right now can call his claim to fame. That on top of a very strong second half that has his team right in this ballgame. So why they're leaving 11:27 up. The referee says we're going to play it that way. They may or may not unplug it. They've got a portable system running the shot clock's side court, and the game system has that game clock above it. So right now the only discussion is whether to leave the 11:27 up on the basket where there's double zero. I just got, if I could read lips correctly, there's no way to turn it off why on don't the they, scorer's table. Why don't they just let Sean Finn go up and dunk it? <laughs> Any one of the Xavier cheerleaders can go up and unplug it. <laughs> the way Romain Sato jumps, maybe he can just <laughs> jump up and grab it. The way Romain Sato jumps, he can go up there, unplug it, make himself a sandwich, and come back down. I 
think Oliver Purnell is trying to make sure that there's not a competitive imbalance here, which is something we've referenced a couple of times since the beginning of this delay. Let's get another update from Larry. Well, as you guys are surmising, uh, Oliver Purnell and Thad Mata, you know, are, are being very good sports. Xavier in this possession. And I don't know if there was a question about whether or not there was a substitution of some kind during the course of that delay. Well, we know that Sean Finn was on the court. David West was at the scorer's table. He's now in. I believe that Finn may have left the game at that timeout. Green checked in. Now that Finn has had his rest, Oliver Purnell wants to get him back in, but he's going to have to wait a whistle, according to Joe DeMeo. Finally back to play with 11.22 left to go in the game, all tied at 44. West on the backdoor cut, intercepted by Wallaskowski. That's all. Trying to bounce pass. Green lost the handle on it, and it will be a Dayton turnover. That's the Flyers' ninth of the game, and Finn will get back in now after sitting out one trip down the floor. Remember we told you earlier in the show, yesterday a career-high 30 minutes, and also third game in three days. You would imagine it's got to be wearing. Especially on the big guys. The guards can run all game long. The shot clock is reading 24. This could really cause some significant problems. I think they're trying to reset it now to get it back where it belongs, and they don't have them synced. One at one end is at 24, the other end at 25. So that becomes a difficulty as well. Any kind of a situation like this, as we said, it's got to be the same at both ends. Take it down to Larry Rosen, Larry. Well, the uh, system that is operating now is shot clocks, which you guys, frankly, won't be able to get a look at with their position. They're on a wireless system, and they have to be synchronized, cued individually. The ones above the basket, of course, are hardwired, and it's given these guys over here from Dayton a chance to say, Our house next year! Back to you guys. Well, I guess they're figuring the UD arena is going to work out just fine for them next year when the Atlantic 10 Men's Championship mature team. I'm not sure how that one ended, but I do know the shot clock is not running right now. Might as well go into a four corner. So now West, working against that 2-3 zone. Looks like the first 11 seconds of the shot clock are being counted manually, and then it counts down from 24. The reason is that's an NBA shot clock. That's why. Marshall got the floater to go. And Dayton Reed takes the lead. Dayton's got to the 2-3 zone now. Sato's got to find a way to get the ball into West. Or into the basket. Great leaping ability from Lorraine Sato, 12 points now. West got the block shot, and also Tomahawk it out of bounds. But what a manly effort by Romain Sato. Big improvement of his game off the dribble. And you notice the recognition he had Walskowski and Finn. He can take both of those guys with his quickness. Sato just four out of 12 from the field. Had a monster game the first time these teams met. 19 points, 15 boards. Morris, nowhere to go. Shot clock has not been a factor since they went to the side. A lot of quick shots. Morris long just turned to look for it, yep. And West lost the handle on the rebound, but Sato covered up. Oh, 
Chalmers. Oh, pretty move to the hole around Morris and Waliskowski. And a finger roll for Lionel Chalmers, who has eight. The shot clocks are not working, Scott. The numbers keep bouncing back and forth. I think they have to be held onto manually and then released after 11 seconds. It might be a good idea to go to Sean Finn, try to get that fourth foul on West. But not even looking for him. Well, the shot clock is at four down in that quarter. And Marshall missed on the finger roll. And now a reach-in foul is going to be called on Marshall in the backcourt off the miss. Big part of Lionel Chalmers' game is visiting the lane. Morris a little bit slow. They hit before the shot blockers came over. You look at the numbers. Dayton does not block a lot of shots as a team. West came open on the inside as the defense shifted. And an easy two for David West to S12. Four-point lead now for the Musketeers. And a foul call on Chalmers. Oh, no, they got the timeout before the contact. So the timeout taken by Oliver Purnell and a 6-0 run by Lionel Chalmers and the Xavier Musketeers. How are the Musketeers generating offense? Same play, Sato baseline again, beautiful delivery. And that's about as easy a basket as we've seen David West get in this tournament. Well, everything on that back line of the 2-3 zone shifted over to that side of the lane, and it came wide open on the other side. Check in with a busy man, Larry Rosen. To have surmised it's an NBA shot clock that the default mechanism defaults them back out to 24. So when the shot clock resets, it'll reset automatically to 24. Then they're counting down verbally and manually before it hits 24. Once it's at 24, then it rolls off on its own. But again, that's a manual reset. There may be, you know, a half second here or there that they've got to worry about. And frankly, I'm worried most about you guys. You've got no shot clocks because they're both on our end of the floor. Now we just take a stand and look down to the other end when the time does come, when it feels like it's been a long time. And you said that it's been pretty end-to-end -end and there hasn't really been a question. You'd hate to think that it would come down to that question in a key possession. And isn't it nice that Larry's so concerned about us? Yes, it is. Schaller's got a hand of the passing lane, knocked it over the sideline. And Dayton will inbound. This Dayton offense has looked very stagnant since we went to the long delay. Remember, right before the shot clock problem, their offense was really starting to click, especially with David West out of the game. Now, one shot clock says 14, the other says 15. Albert Purnell just asked Joe DeMeo, which is which? It is 14. Marshall strong with a three, and Chalmers got an uncontested rebound. Hey, David West is demanding the ball. I cannot figure out why they don't get it to him. I've never seen him so animated. There it is as he steps down now and does receive the basketball, but not where he wanted it. Jackson, big take to the hole, and got the foul called on Finn. That'll be the big man's third. See, there's the beauty of David West's attack. They didn't give it on the block. He stepped out to the perimeter. Defense was coming. And what did he do? He shared the ball. Now, look at Step out. He's got a mismatch. He's ready to take him downstairs. But look at He's got the recognition. The top passing big man in the Atlantic 10. So Keith Jackson, the freshman from Cincinnati, to the line. And hitting on the first. That's Finn's third foul. He's going to sit down. They cannot afford to have him with number four. Now it is seven to two Xavier now since we return from the shot clock delay. So the Musketeers been quicker to bounce back. One out of two for Jackson. Five point Musketeer lead. Marshall. Marshall's had a tough game as well. He and Chalmers have not shot well. Shot clocks at 12. You 
say so. Wallace from 15. Got it. Gets his team back to within three. Wallace 16 points on the night. He's having a good shooting night. It's six out of eight from the floor. Wallace Kowski's been the best player on the court. 2 3 zone. Trying to encourage the perimeter game. Inside that zone, Chalmers tried to break it and threw it away. Good penetration by Chalmers, but the bullet passed just beyond the reach of a very frustrated David West on the play. Nonetheless, Xavier on top by three. One to play, and on top of having a big second half, there's the troublemaker who made sure that this one took a while. As you look back at our Citizens Bank, not your typical play of the game. Now, Sean's a, a finesse player. They wanted to bring more power. Well, he did. He actually took power away. And you saw the saga as everybody in this building did everything they could, well, almost everybody, to try to fix it. And finally, a meeting of the minds was reached. Citizens Bank, not your typical bank. Troublemaker, huh? Well, it was his fault. However, he is teamed with Wallace Huge front-line contribution to the Dayton Flyers tonight. We talked in the open about the fact that this game would be one that could focus on the middle of the floor and on the area in the paint, and that has been Dayton's area tonight. Before the game, I felt that Dayton would love to have a draw inside and try to win it on the perimeter. It's been the opposite. Walskowski and Finn had combined for 29 points. So the Flyers sitting Finn down now with three fouls. Bring it up into the forecourt. Three-point ball game. Under six and a half to go. Dante Holland off the miss. And a rebound down to David West, who's eight. For those tuning in late, maybe wondering where David Young is. He has a hairline fracture of his left wrist from last evening's game. He has not played. He is not suited up. Jackson and Brown done a good job. West pounded it inside around Wallace Great position inside. He made himself big. And a looping pass over the top gives him a chance at a three-point play. And what a tempting post-target David West provides. Notice him get big. Wallace cannot cover him on the three-quarter front. And the fall there was Brooks Hall. He came late on the weak side rotation. That's three on Wallace And West now five out of six from the free throw line in this one. He has 15 points, 8 rebounds, and his team once again has itself a lead, this time 6. Starting to get back to the foul line a little bit, too. There's something they were not doing. Dayton was not fouling to begin this second half. Nowhere for Morris to go. Hall, who's been awfully quiet, trying to heat it up. And Brooks Hall, very in that shot, now has 8 down the game on just 3 out of 10 shooting. Big question, how long do you keep Sean Finn on the bench? He's been very strong at both ends of the court. The answer is not much longer. Trying hard to work against that 2-3. West again got big inside. So 17 now for David West. And the Musketeers up again by five. Ball, nice move to the inside and got fouled on his way in. He'll earn a trip to the free throw line to shoot two with a foul call on Keith Jackson. Xavier, however, just two team fouls in his second half. It is the Verizon Atlantic 10 championship, the semifinal round. The Dayton Flyers and Xavier Musketeers in game one here in Philadelphia. Scott Graham, Tim McCormick, and Larry Rosen on hand with you. Brooks Hall at the line with a two-shot foul. Sean Finn, who's had a huge second half, sat down for rest and with three fouls, comes back into the game. Now, worth revisiting that Brooks Hall is the only player on the Dayton squad who received all A-10 recognition. He's been quiet, but the thing that impresses me, the Flyers have such outstanding balance. 
if you just joined us and are wondering why we're still playing, there was a long delay here after a dunk by Sean Finn knocked out one of the game and shot clocks above the basket. The temporaries are now being used down in the corner. Shot is short, and a rebound for Wallace Chance to run, but they throw it away. Here comes West. Good defense by Wallace and the ball off Sato and out of bounds. This game has been all about who's getting it done at the power positions. Wallace and Finn have been very strong. David West is putting up numbers, but he's four out of 13 from the field. See the turnover story has been very low for the Flyers here in the second half. Trying to get within two or one on this possession. Shot clock down to ten. And you've got to go to Finn, fronted by Fry, but Morris missed with an air ball. And Fry comes down with the rebound. Part of the reason they're not going to Finn is because he's a new star on their team. He's had three very good games, but before that, he was a non-factor. I don't think they know how to get him the ball. And Hall comes from the weak side and steals the bounce pass. That was a lazy throw to the baseline for West. Three and a half left to go in a four-point game. Marshall had it knocked away by Sato, and the ball will belong to the Dayton Flyers when we come back. Shots falling or not, shot clocks or not, this game is going right down to the wire. David West, the big man and player of the year, hopes to be the difference in the final 321. Players have gotten over the first two humps, trying for number three, and perhaps the biggest, the Verizon game story with 321 to go. Dayton is shooting just 38%. Their percentage has dropped precipitously since the early moments of this game. They've been getting out on the fast break and improving that. David West slowly coming around again here in the second half. 17 points and eight rebounds for this four-point Musketeer lead. Two teams fatigued. They dealt with adversity. I believe the victor here is going to have some success in the lane. Can't rely on the jump shots. Brooks all with time winding down on the makeshift shot clock. Better launch. And he had to. Got it up on the rim in time to avoid the violation. He was being helped along by some Dayton fans that were helping to count it down for him from the stands. Xavier is shooting 11 out of 16 here in the second half. But they've turned it over eight times. West, there you go. Yeah, I can't tell you how impressed I am with that play right there. That's big time. That's what he's been calling for this entire second half. He now has 19. Six-point edge as we come up on two and a half left to play. Then turned on him and couldn't get it to go. And West sealed him off for his ninth rebound. That's just good offense versus very good defense. That is a guy who is coming into his own against the guy who is already here. And a foul call with 2.14 left to go. David West, the last seven points for the Xavier Musketeers. Notice as he faces, this is what separates him from other big men. Also, notice the high release point on his jump shot. Doesn't face many 6'11 defenders here. Finn's going to come from the weak side. Walskowski's on him. He contested very well. There's just no way you're going to stop that. Well, the soft touch shot and a timeout being called for by the Dayton Flyers. This is a full timeout with 2.14 left to go in the game. And Xavier going to get the inbound of the basketball and a fresh shot clock with that 2.14 remaining. If you're Dayton right now, You've got to be feeling a lot of fatigue based upon three games in three days, but you've got to realize that this opportunity is right there for you. And, Tim, you made reference before the game. You don't want to look past the game you're playing in a tournament format, but when you look to the other side of the bracket, you got to think that either one of these teams would be confident in taking their chances with a Richmond or a LaSalle. Let me take a look at that last play because there's a real nice defensive adjustment. 
Notice when West catches the ball. Sean Finn is right here. He's going to locate down there, and he's going to be ready to come and block in case there's any offensive move. He's in this position. He's helped. He's going to go up strong. David West recognized that and said, I'm not going inside. Well, that is a smart player. One of the many reasons that junior is once again the player of the year. Four out of five since halftime after shooting three out of 12 in the first half. Don't forget our second game still coming up with Sal and Richmond. That is next. David using a little block. Fry the runner. Soft touch, got it on the rim. And most importantly now, it's a three possession game as we cross the two minute mark. Dayton needs a basket right now. Remember last year they had Tony Stanley, he was the go-to guy. Who is the go-to guy on this team? They don't have one. From time to time, that's the go-to guy, but two men on haul. A uh, go-to guy can put it on the floor and get a shot anytime you want. Shot clock is at seven. And it falls. And a quick timeout for Oliver Purnell. With 1.22 to go, his team back within six. One timeout left now for the Dayton Flyers. You can expect a patient approach by Thad Mata's team, and Oliver Purnell knows that. Mata is going to have his team spread the court. Lionel Chalmers will get a lot of time with the ball in his hand. And this is a time where you would miss David Young. David West. Once again, the Atlantic 10 Player of the Year this year. He really turned it on as the game has moved on. And he's scored in a variety of ways, Scott. His game is loaded. He stepped out on the perimeter. He's demanded the ball inside. But this is the one thing that, that really separates him, the little mid-range jump shot. So your game reset with 1.22 to go. Possession arrow for Dayton. Remember the Flyers, one timeout left. A lot of fouls to give on both sides. Marshall may have tried to give one up there and didn't. And Sato underneath does get fouled. Very nearly a chance for a three-point play, but he'll go to the line to shoot two with a foul on Wallace And if you're going to gamble and play full-court pressure, it's not something that Dayton does. You have to expect that you may get beat in transition. Good recognition by Romain Sato. You know who's really benefited from the shot clock going out is David West. After that interruption, he has come out and he's taken his game over. Wallace draws his fourth. West nine points in the last nine minutes since that delay. So with 1.15 to go, Sato can still make it a three possession game and does, extending Xavier's lead to seven. The difference between these two teams, Xavier is a little bit more athletic, especially inside. Ball on the catch and shoot, nails the three. And Albert Purnell will use his final timeout as his team is within four now with 107 to go. Ball with 12 points. That is something that has not been there for Brooks Hall most of the night. You have to give a lot of credit to the defensive attack on the perimeter for Xavier. Coming off a Two screen look, Brooks Hall rises up. He's an excellent shooter. Defensively, Keith Jackson is trailing him. He went over the top, you've got to follow that screen. If you don't follow Brooks Hall, boy, he's got a quick release. As a matter of fact, Oliver Purnell said that he has one of the quickest releases of any player that he's ever seen. One of the best three-point shooters in flyer history. You would imagine with one more year coming, the bad record will fall. Last time, Xavier was in attack mode. They broke the press. They got the ball to Sato. It is still a two-possession game. Remember, as I said, there are fouls to give. Dayton, with the next one, would put Xavier on the line. And a quick timeout called for by Xavier as they brought it across the stripe with 57.7 to go. No more fouls to give. A correction. The next one does put Xavier at the line for the one and one. At this point, Thad Mata talking. Time, score, foul, timeout. All of the, the game management issues that are so important. 
got to make sure that your guys know exactly how many timeouts you have, that who the better free throw shooters are. You've got to spread the court. And probably most important, you've got to be rugged with the ball. You've got to get those vice grip locks on top of it. Nobody's going to take it from you. There's some experience, a part of Alvin Brown and building experience. Speaking of building, Richmond's fans are in it. Open again with Sal, as they say, caught in their web. Coming up next, second half of this semifinal doubleheader. It's Sal Explorers and Richmond Spiders for the right to face the winner of this one tomorrow night for the championship. Shot clock becomes so important now because Xavier's going to keep playing with the ball until that shot clock gets down. It's under 10. Sato wide open. Can't get it and does. It falls off and back in for Romain Sato. A dagger shot now with 38 seconds left. Three possession gain. There's no need to wait. You've got to launch. Oh, no. Well, once again, plenty of fouls to give for Xavier. Why not? That's only their third team foul for the second half. Rather than give up the easy shot, you might as well slow down their progress. Very good point. 30.7 to go. Don't be surprised to see them do it again, as long as it's not in shooting mode. And we talked about the fact that Thad Mata's team has stressed last night. They didn't foul and put UMass on the line. Anytime that it looks like there's going to be a shot up, they're going to foul. Marshall, a little bit short with it. Green can't get the put back. And the tip follow will belong, I believe, to Brooks Hall. That gets it back to a two-possession game. He won. Oh, and Sato got the timeout oh, before oh, a possible oh. travel. And Oliver Purnell is furious, as is the Dayton bench. They are furious. They believe that Sato traveled with the basketball before the timeout call. Yeah. Ron Jersa from Dayton did a nice little dance. Wow, that was a close call. Very important in the outcome of this game. Leave Xavier with just one timeout, a full timeout remaining. How close did Sato come to traveling with the basketball? Off the inbound. Oh, looked like a travel to me. He stubbed feet with Nate Green. It threw him off balance. We said the one time out left. Possession arrow belongs to Dayton in a held ball situation. This is the big number right there. Three fouls for the Musketeers can put them in a situation where if they've got an open shot, just follow them and let them take it out. Dayton running out of time. They need a steal. And West does get the basketball and gets fouled. It'll be a one and one for David West with 17.2 to go. five-point game should he make a pair of them and get it back to three possession otherwise the door creaks slightly open for the Flyers now with 17.2 left yeah, and what kind of a clutch fall shooter is David West yesterday versus UMass eight out of eight from the line Six percent, top ten Atlantic ten. Part of the reason he's so effective as a big man of this conference, hitting his free throws. And does right there a pressure shot on the front end of the one and one. Still a two possession game. This is a very significant free throw. If he makes this, very difficult for Dayton to make a comeback. And does no Huge. timeouts. Huge Dayton. pair of free throws for David West and for Xavier. He's got 21 points in the game now. 13 of them have come since halftime. Put Jackson in the game for a defensive assignment. Remember the foul to give, and Chalmers says, you're not going around me if I can give it up with 13.5 to go. He'll make them inbound it again. That is just the fourth team foul for the Musketeers. They can foul and not give Dayton a chance to score the rest of this game. This is basically game over, Scott. And a big part of it is Thad Mata's team did not foul early. You don't want to foul on the shot. Now Brooks Hall kicks it back outside, and Marshall firing. Still can't get it. 
And Dayton, for the third time this year, is going to come up a buck short against the Xavier Musketeers. First time ever that Xavier has beaten Dayton three times in one season. There is emotion, maybe even elation for this Xavier team. They have had two very difficult bumps in the road on the way to the championship game. But that's where they're headed, right back to this floor tomorrow night for the Atlantic 10 men's title. Xavier has really shown some toughness. The way they came back in last night's game versus UMass, they could have lost that. Dayton is an excellent team. They provided a stiff amount of recognition inside the paint by going inside to Finn and Walskowski. But nothing seems to be rattling Thad Mata's team. Well, they were saying that that was indeed a one and one. And There's nobody zero. was there to actually rebound the basketball so they're giving it back to Dayton with just a three tenths of a second they proved in the NBA sometime back that you can't actually catch and shoot in this period of time so that's it game over the ball game is over number 23 Xavier the top seed overall in the Atlantic 10 men's championship has advanced to the final for the second time and they will play the winner of the upcoming LaSalle Richmond game for the 2002 Atlantic 10 men's championship West, big second half. Lionel Chalmers helping to set him up in that second half. Had six assists in the game, and Xavier survives once again. More than anything else, this is an evenly matched game. Two excellent teams. Xavier won because they got the first round by. They seem a little more fresh at the end. Disappointment on the part of Dayton coming this far, winning 20 games. They are not going to win the Atlantic 10 Tournament Championship. The question for them is what is next with their 20 and 10 overall record on the season and this loss in the semifinals. 66 to 59, a hard fought game with fits and starts and very memorable stoppages as well. But the Xavier Musketeers are one step away now from winning the Atlantic 10 Championship. We'll be back in a moment.